uh, today I'll be talking about product engineering. Um, so I've worked with a lot of different companies. I've worked with large companies, I've worked with small companies. And companies tend to be very different in the way they do things. They're different in their processes, they're different in their marketing strategies, they're different in their sales strategies. But the one thing that I have found that is constant among all successful companies is this. They all have great products. Um, this is interesting because I've never seen a successful company with a bad product, right? So it doesn't matter what else you do, if you don't have a great product, nothing else really matters. So today what I'd like to focus on is exactly this, is my experiences in building products, specifically software products. Now, if you do a good job, if you become a successful company and you're building great products, you're going to have competitors. This makes sense, right? If you're doing something right, people will want to copy you. People will want to challenge you. And this is okay. You shouldn't be scared of competition. Competition is a good thing. It's a healthy thing. But in order to compete in this market, what you have to do is you have to constantly innovate. So what this means is that it's not enough to build a good product. You have to build a product that is agile, a product that can change over time, a product that you can change the design of, a product that you can add new features to, etc., etc. a product that you can evolve over time. And so it's important to not only build a great product, but a product that is agile as well. And so we'll talk about some of the things that I've learned in doing this as well, moving forward. So right off the bat, before you start coding, Right? I've seen many pro uh, companies where the moment they want to build a product, right away the team gets together and they just start hacking. Just code, 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 go, go, go. Before you do all that, take a step back for a moment and think. The first thing I always like to do before I build anything is go through what I call an analysis phase. In an analysis phase, you basically ask two questions. One. What problem are you trying to solve? And two, is your proposed solution actually solving the problem you're trying to solve? If it's not, you're doing something wrong. If it's not, there's no point in building what you're building. You're going to spend a lot of time writing code that no one is actually going to use. So, first and foremost, understand these questions. Then, once you understand that, then your solution becomes a set of features that you implement. Don't, when you're building a product, a lot of times engineers get excited about what they're building and they just add features. Ooh, I can add this, I can add this capability, I can add that capability. The problem is some features actually hurt your product more than they help your product. For example, one thing that you will often see is that in user interfaces, you have lots of buttons. Lots of buttons is not a good thing. On one hand, you think, well, lots of buttons means the software can do lots of different things. But the problem is it adds clutter. It makes your software more difficult to use. It's better to have one button that does exactly what the user wants than 10 buttons where nine of them are kind of useless. Right? So it's important when you build things, make sure that you're actually building things to solve the particular problem that you're solving and remove all the other clutter. Right? Clear out your software, only keep what you absolutely need. Okay. The second part is architecture. Again, before you start hacking, have a zoom out view of your system. What database are you going to use? Are you going to do a server client architecture? Is your software going to work on mobile? Is it only going to work in regular standard computer screens, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Understand the high level structure of your system. Then, and still before you start hacking, understand the different pieces of your system. This is known as software design. So, the set, what, so remember, we don't build large systems, right? What we build are small individual components that then come together to build our larger systems, right? We all know this. Well, when you're designing your individual pieces, don't worry about the implementation. That is to say, don't worry about how each piece is going to work. That's later. But do think about what it needs to do. In other words, figure out the what, not the how. Once you've figured out each individual piece and what it needs to do, what you're developing is the interfaces or the APIs. Can anyone tell me what an interface is? Who knows what an interface is? Go. 
Right. So an interface at, as an abstract term. <laughs> okay. So an interface just means a medium between two things. It's a medium through which two things can communicate with each other. Okay. A programming interface is exactly this for programs. So you have some code here and some code here. You have an interface, this medium, through which the two pieces of program can communicate with each other. Right? So what you're defining are your interfaces, the communication channels between the pieces. And because you're trying to understand what each piece is going to do, you're basically defining behavior. You're saying this piece will do this, this piece will do that, and here is how they will communicate. The how, the implementation details of how this piece will work, is something you can leave for later. And the great part about this is the implementation details can actually change over time without affecting the rest of the system. Kind of with me? Okay. Now, once you've thought about it, of how you want to build your system, once you've thought about the individual pieces, you should write it down. It makes sense. What if you forget, right? Okay. But how do you write it down? What is a good way of really specifying this, these promises, these communication channels between the various modules that you're building? Um, you have a spec. A spec is where you're specifying this is how the software should work. These are the pieces, and this is how they should communicate. But the problem is, when you're writing code, how do you know that the code that you're writing will fit that spec? In the specification, you say this module should do this. Then you write code. How do you know that what you wrote matches what you specified in the spec? How do you know that later, when you modify the software, it will continue to match the spec, that you won't break something? Anyone have an idea? Yes. You write unit test for <laughs> Banana for you. Here. Okay. Perfect. Exactly. What you do is you convert your specs, your specifications, into tests, into automated tests. And what you do is you run your test. And when your test passes, you know that your code matches the spec. And the great part about this is later when you modify your software, all you have to do is rerun your tests and validate and assert that the changes that you made did not break the original promises, the original spec. Make sense? Okay. Now, Douglas Crockford says that complexity is the enemy of software, and I agree with him 100%. Software engineering, programming, in my opinion and in his, is the most complicated thing that people do. What? but people build like airplanes. Isn't that more complicated? What's the most complicated part of an airplane? Software. The software in the airplane. Software is the most complicated thing. And let me explain why. We have an agreement with a computer that our programs, the code that we write, has to be perfect in every way for every possible inputs and every possible outputs. And if it's not perfect, the computer has license to do the worst possible thing at the worst possible time. So our code has to be perfect. And the problem is humans are not good at perfect. We're not perfect and so we don't write perfect code. So we're trying to build something that is perfect but we are unable to write perfection. That's kind of a problem, you might think. Uh, and in the 60s, people recognized that this is a problem, and they tried to solve it by uh, this notion of proof of correctness. What is proof of correctness? Proof of correctness is an attempt to prove the correctness of software through mathematical proofs. And they tried this. They tried to prove, whenever you wrote code, mathematically that it is correct. It failed. The reason why it failed is because the mathematical proofs that they tried to create to prove your software were actually more complicated than the original programs that you were writing. And so that didn't work. So this is a problem, right? And the, the other problem is, how do you know if you've even achieved perfection? You don't know if your code is ever perfect. There's nothing to tell you your code is now perfect. Tests don't tell you. 
tests only tell you when there's a bug. They don't tell you the non-existence of bugs, right? So we're living in this world where we're trying to write perfect code, but even if we achieve perfection, we don't know it. So software engineering is incredibly difficult to get right. And so while it's important to have tests to help you move along, tests are actually not enough. You need more. And I will talk about some additional patterns that will help you write better quality code moving forward. Okay, so what are some of the things that you can do to simplify your code, to simplify the complexity of your code? One thing is simple, write less code. The less code you have, the simpler your software will be. Okay? Intuitively, I think most of you get this, right? The more code you have, the more opportunity there is for error, right? The more of a chance that you made something wrong. Furthermore, the more code you write, the more code you have to read. If you think about it, when you're writing your code, you're not actually just writing, right? You write a little bit, then you read, and then you write a little bit, and then you read, and then you go get water, come back, you read some more, right? You go home, you come back, you read some more. You're constantly reading code. The more code you have to read, the longer and more complicated it's going to be. It's much harder to understand this much code than it is to understand that much code. Fair, right? Okay, so what are some of the things you can do to write less code? Well, one thing is to try to leverage other people's code. There are libraries and frameworks out there developed by great professionals that you can leverage in your software to help you write less code, right? Frameworks, in fact, are exactly this. They're designed to help you write as little code as you possibly can. And the framework does everything else, right? So if you want to minimize the amount of code that you're writing, use frameworks, use libraries. Furthermore, when you're developing an algorithm or you're writing a function, right? It's not enough, in my opinion, to just make it work, okay? Making code work is not enough. In fact, people who are just starting out in software, when they're giving a, given a task, they sit there and they just try to implement that and they go, okay, I did it. It matches the spec, I'm done. No, you're not. Just getting your code to work doesn't mean you're done. It's important to not just produce a solution, but an elegant solution. And what is an elegant solution? In my opinion, and more often than not, an elegant solution is usually the simpler one, the one that is smaller. So it's not enough to just write code. If you can write the same code in this much instead of that, then you did something wrong. When you're implementing something, anything, try to make it as small as you possibly can, as simple as you possibly can, and as readable as you possibly can. Go. It's true that there are cases where less code is more complicated to understand. I agree with you. In that case, don't. Always take simplicity over size. But typically and very often, less code is usually simpler. Usually. Not always. By the way, by less code, I don't mean like take something that is five lines and try to like turn it into one long line. That's not less code, you're just changing the structure, right? It's still just as comp, it's the same complexity, actually. Um, that's not what I mean. You should still try to keep your code readable. I mean the solution, I mean the algorithm. I mean the complexity of the steps that you're taking should be simple and easy to read. In fact, one thing that I would actually argue is that I would take simplicity over performance. Um, in other words, be careful about this, but very often I will write code that is easier to read, but is not as fast as something that I could write faster, but much more complicated. In other words, I take simplicity over performance. The reason for this is because from my experience, writing correct code is much more difficult than writing fast code. Let me say that again. Writing correct code, that is, that is to say code that does not have mistakes in it, is diffi more difficult than it is to write code that just runs faster. And what I can always do is write code that is correct, that I know is going to work and that's simple to understand, easy to debug, easy to change. And then later, if I feel like this is a performance bottleneck, I can go back and tweak it. 
That is better than writing your code like this, making it run super fast, but now you can't touch anything because everything breaks, or you can't understand anything, and it has bugs. See the trade-off? Okay. So, if you can, write less code. Okay, remove dead code. What do I mean by dead code? So dead code is code in your software that never actually does anything. When does this happen? This usually happens for two reasons. One is doing a refactor. So you have a function that maybe depends on some other code. You refactor that function, which ends up eliminating the dependency on this other code, but this code is still there and it never runs. But it's still in your code, it's still in your project, it's still in your software, right? That's an example where you have dead code. Another example is uh, you will have engineers that try to write additional code thinking it might be helpful in the future, right? Um, don't do that. So let me explain why. Um, if you want to write additional code that you think is cool or useful or whatever, you can still write it, just don't put it into the product. Put it in a separate project, maybe put it open source it, throw it on GitHub, do whatever you want, but don't put it into the product because you're adding more, com more code, therefore more complexity to the project that's already getting complicated. Keep it out. Then later when you need it, if you need it, then okay, take it, put it in. But don't put it in thinking you might need it in the future. Make sense? So keep your code as small as possible. Only put in there what you absolutely need. Okay. So bananas, uh, don't fall in. Don't get emotionally attached to your code. Okay. I, I've worked at IBM. I've worked at smaller companies. I've worked everywhere, and everywhere I see this. Engineers love their code. It's like they're babies. Why is that a problem? First of all, it's as important to write code as it is to delete code. I love deleting code. Because when you delete code from your project, you are eliminating complexity, right? You're getting rid of all this uh, code. Blah, boom. Ah, done, right? It's making your life easier when you remove code. Right? But if you have emotional attachment, oh, well, I spent like the weekend working on it and I, I remember writing this function. It's harder to get rid of it, first. Second, uh, you may implement something, but then find, let's say, a library that does it better. Okay, it makes sense, you would think, okay, then drop what you did, use the library, right? The library may already come with unit tests, or it has support, and it already does something that you're doing, and it does it better. Why not use the library over the code that you wrote, right? Or you wrote something, but another engineer doing a code review says, yeah, but you know, the algorithm you implemented wasn't that great. You could do it this way, which is completely different. Maybe it requires a rewrite. Oh, but I spent all this time, it's my code. They have this emotional love for their code. No, focus on what is best and what is correct, not what you love. Love has nothing to do with this, sorry. Um, if there's a better way to do something, do it, okay? Remove all this emotional attachment that you have to your code and do the right thing. If there's a better way to write the code, remove the crap that you wrote as much as you love it, do it the right way. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, basically, uh, most of the time the libraries you use, uh -huh. uh, they do way more that you, than you need them to do. Yes. And in that case, uh, you are increasing the complexity. Yes. I mean, isn't it better to implement the part of the algorithm that you really need yep. instead of using the library which does a lot of more things you don't need? Good point. So it, what you're talking about is called bloat. So bloat is where you're adding stuff to your code that you don't actually need. This you could actually classify as dead code if you think about it, right? Dead code is exactly this. It's code that is in your project that's not being used. And by adding a library, if all you're using is just a few functions, the rest of it is just dead code, right? Going back to my previous thing. So you're right, this is certainly something you should take into account. One thing that you could do though is, let's say you implemented your solution, right? And you find a library that does it better. 
if it's an open source library, you could look at the source and use that to, to help you modify and tweak your code and not actually use the, so the library. Absolutely. Uh, what I'm referring to, so you absolutely need to take, anytime you're using additional code, you're bringing other external code, whether it's a framework or a library in from the outside, consider how much of it you're using. And if too much of it is dead code, you might not want to use it. Or go and find a smaller library that just has what you want. And if none of that works, then yes, then you implement your own solution. Just know that the more code you yourself write, the more code you yourself are responsible for. Um, the trade-off is this. Libraries, especially sort of the more popular open source libraries, have lots of users, right? Which means lots of different combinations of use cases have happened for that code. That is to say, bugs that you might have found later will already have been found. Unit tests may have already been written for it, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas when you write code, it's new, it's fresh. No one has used it yet. So all the potential bugs that you might have are still in your path. So you have to take all of these trade-offs into account. But generally speaking, yes, be careful when you're taking a library. If you're only going to be using a small piece of it, it might not make sense to take the whole thing. Absolutely. Great point. Yes? So the library, right? the library is, the is it what? I'm sorry? Ah, okay, okay. So very quickly. Just, okay. So uh, code can be sort of packaged up. Right? You've packaged it up into functions, but you can imagine packaging up into object, like functions inside an object, and then you can imagine that being packaged up into separate files. That file may be written by someone other than you, right? So I can write one of these files and maybe put it on GitHub. You then download from GitHub and just add it to your project, right? So now you have the code that I wrote and you have the code that you wrote. My code would then have an interface, that is to say a series of public functions that you can reference to use my library to use my code. That reusable code that you can use or someone else can use is typically called a library, okay? Then we have frameworks. The general difference, by the way, that I found between a library and a framework is this. With a library, you're writing your code, and then when you need something, you call a library to do something for you, and then it returns and you keep going. Right? So you have control over the main structure, but then you call the library to do something, it returns and you keep going. Fine, right? With a framework, it's exactly the opposite. The framework controls the overall structure of your system, but then calls your code to do something, returns, and then it continues. See the difference? Angular, for example, right? Angular JS, for those of you who might have used it, right? It controls the actual application, the actual app is done by the application. You just give it hints about routing, and you give it hints about what to render in the various directives. But it decides when to call your directive, it decides when to refresh, it decides everything else. You just, give, you just fill in the functions that you need, that it tells you to. Cool? Uh, other questions before we move on? Okay, you get a banana, by the way. This is yours, okay. Uh, cool. So, coding conventions, programming conventions. Um, programming conventions are there to help you minimize mistakes. They're not there to make your code beautiful or... Nah, it's not about that. It's about minimizing mistakes. Let me give an example from JavaScript. Right? So, in most programming languages, when you write your curly braces, your blocks, right? it doesn't really matter whether you put them on the next line or the same line. right? In Objective-C and C++ in Java, some people like it that way, some people like it that way. Honestly, there's no real reason to put one there or there, except that if everybody else on your team is doing it one way, you should probably do the same, just so your code isn't half this way, half that way. Fine. In JavaScript, we have a convention, though, that we always put these on the same line. Why? For those of you who know JavaScript, this is a function. What does it return? All right, cool. Some of you know. Great. So intuitively, reading this, if you have a Java background or a C-sharp background or whatever, you think, OK, well, you have a function that returns an object that has a name attribute of foo. Right? The problem, though, is that JavaScript has what's known as automatic semicolon insertion. 
And what it will do is when it reads return, it will put a semicolon there and return, well, nothing, which in JavaScript is undefined. And so for this reason, because we have this convention of always putting the curlies on the first line, if you were to put this here, you would get the right result. Right? So again, no one's forcing you to do it that way or this way. It's a convention, right? It's an agreed upon convention that if you're writing in JavaScript, you should be putting your curlies on the, in the same line. Right? This is what I mean. Conventions are there to help you minimize mistakes, not to make your code more beautiful. It has nothing to do with emotion. It has to do with correctness. Right? So understand the conventions of whatever programming language you're using and stick to them because they will help you minimize mistakes. Cool? Okay. Um, a minor thing, but I think kind of important, is try to minimize the number of blocks, sort of nested blocks that you have in your code. If you have a for loop and then you have an if statement that checks something, shows some condition, don't wrap the entire logic in this one big if statement and push everything in. Instead, just check a condition. If it's wrong, continue. If not, then write all your code at the same blockage. You see, the, the more nesting you have in your code, the harder it is to follow and read and understand your code. Try to keep your code as flat as you possibly can. Occasionally, yes, you need an if statement, you need to, but try to keep it as flat as you can. The more nesting you have, the harder it is to keep track of where you are. Okay? Cool. Okay. I've had, I've worked with a lot of engineers that know every part of the programming language that we're using, every detail. And they will try to basically show off. They will try to use in their code every little part of the programming language that basically nobody else knows. Why is this a problem? Well, for one thing, you're writing code that nobody else knows. That should already tell you something, right? You work in a team, typically. And if you're writing code that nobody else understands, other people are not going to be able to debug it. They're not going to be able to understand it or modify it. This is going to be a major problem moving forward. The second thing is that not all parts of a language are actually that good. There's a reason why some of the parts of a language are never used or that people don't know them. For example, a with statement in JavaScript. Raise your hand if you know what this is. Okay, cool. You guys are awesome. You got more bananas for you. Um, okay, do you ever use a with statement in your code? And do you? Uh, no. John, I'm so glad you don't. Okay, a with statement is actually a harmful statement because it can leak global variables. And in fact, if you write in strict mode, use strict, you can't use this. This is turned off in strict mode for a good reason because it's a harmful attribute. It's a harmful... Um, call. Uh, go-to statements. Does anyone remember go-to statements? You've used, have you used go-to statements? Oh my god. Do you still use go-to statements? No. Exactly. Of course not, right? Dijkstra, so Dijkstra, you guys have studied Dijkstra's algorithm? The shortest path in the graph? Okay, so that guy wrote a paper where he wrote, where he basically described why go-to statements are bad. They're harmful to the software. They make it very easy to introduce bugs in your code. It's difficult to write correct code using go-tos. Think of it that way. But go-tos exist, as you, as you mentioned, sir. They exist in C. But you shouldn't be using them. And if you use them, A, other people may not know about go-to statements, so they may not be able to debug your code, and B, you shouldn't be using them. <laughs> okay, so don't use so try to write your code in a way that it's readable in a way that it's standard and don't try to use every part of a language try to use the good parts of a language in whatever language you're coding in okay refactor ruthlessly and rewrite bravely <laughs> this is the, like a good mantra to have as you're writing code as the code that you're writing gets bigger and bigger and bigger and your project gets bigger and bigger and bigger it's going to become messier. Every time you modify your code, every time you introduce features, your code is going to get more complicated and generally speaking, messier, dirtier. 
just not as you know it loses when you first write your code your first iteration you've really thought about it and you've constructed your code in a certain way and it has this flow to it right it's this beautiful thing then you start adding features to it and you start like tweaking this and hacking that and pushing this and man and eventually your code turns into this yeah now if you keep doing this Eventually your code will just get dirtier and dirtier and more and more complicated and eventually become so messy and dirty and disgusting that A, you will hate it, but B, it will make it that much harder to then add more features. Remember, one of the key things that your product has to have, one of the key attributes is it needs to be agile. You want to be able to modify your project over time to compete. Right? Well, if you keep complicating your software, it's going to become that much harder to modify it. Right? Okay. So one of the things you should be doing as software engineers all the time is as you're writing your code, constantly refactor. Constantly. Every time you, there's actually a good rule of thumb. Every time you check something out of Git, whenever you push something back, try to push something that's cleaner than when you pulled. Okay, so as you're reading code, if you find code that is dirty or difficult to understand, just rewrite it. If you, under, if you feel like the structure of something isn't right, like this would go better here or here, this thing should actually be ripped apart into do, do that. Refactor constantly. Always modify and clean your code. It's like your room, right? You shouldn't just clean it one time when you move in and then just woo -woo. No, you co you're constantly cleaning your room right you're constantly keeping it nice and neat code is exactly the same you constantly need to need to clean it refactor it maintain it etc in order to, for it to stay clean otherwise it will not and it will start to smell and it will start to smell really badly with me now when you're doing all of this refactoring, when you're changing all your code and you're saying, oh, this is crap, we're going to rip this out, we're going to add this in, we're going to rewrite this, and you're making all these changes, remember that all of this code was matching a spec at some point, right? How do you know that when you're making these changes, you're not breaking all of these specs? You're not breaking the promises that they made to the rest of the system. How do you know? Exactly, John. You run the test. Remember, you have automated tests that will make the assertions that whatever you wrote fits with the promises that you made to the rest of the system. This is why automated tests are so important. If you don't have automated tests, refactoring, changing, rewriting becomes very difficult because you're terrified. Imagine changing a piece of code that touches almost the entire system. And try to push that to master. That's then going to go into production. You're like, <laughs> you're like terrified, because there is nothing to tell you it's okay. You know, balik jan lava. Does does not. You don't have that. It's just up to you. You're hoping and praying that what you did didn't introduce mistakes. The problem is hoping and praying doesn't help you build software. Good software practices help you build software, right? And one of them is to have unit tests. Exactly, automated testing. Cool? All right. So, <laughs> remember that most of the time you're reading your code. You're not, when you're programming, you're not typing. Most of the time, you're reading your code. You're debugging your code. You're trying to understand what the heck it is that you did. You're, you know, you add something and you go, wait, what was this again? You scroll up and you read, and then you go into another function. You read that, you go, ah, oh, okay. You're constantly reading your code. So it makes sense that if you're reading your code, you should read code that is readable, that is easy to understand, right? Okay, why do we have formatting in code? The whole reason why we have formatting in code is so that your code is easier to read and easier to understand. Why did I go through all this? Most of you are like, well, yeah, of course you should format. You think? You will not believe how many engineers have been, like, they're hacking, and I go to, and their, their code is like this. There's no structure, there's like, there's no tabbing, it's just, and I say, you know, what are you doing? No, no, here's what they say. Don't worry. I will format before I push to Git. Which defeats the whole, I understand their point. They're saying, don't worry, I will format so when I push, other people will be able to read it. But the person that reads your code the most is you. 
so why would you do that to yourself, right? Okay, another, think of it this way. Imagine solving a really long math equation, right? In math, you guys know this better than I do, it's very, you have to be, in fact, that's why the, the paper has these, the grid on it, right? It's so that you can make sure you line up all your numbers and you be very exact. And you do this for two reasons. One, so that when, if you make a mistake, your teacher can see your work and say, ah, okay, Balik Jan, you know, you did most of it right, I will give you partial credit. That's one reason. But the second reason is so that if you make a mistake, you can go through your work and find where you did something wrong, right? Code is exactly this. It, when you have a bug, when something doesn't work right, you need to be able to step through your logic and find where you made that mistake. And if your code is not formatted properly, doing that is going to be that much more difficult. So make life easier for yourself. Keep your code as clean and formatted as you possibly can. Cool? Okay. Um, avoid tight coupling in your code. Raise your hands if you know what tight coupling is. Okay, all right, some people who, all right, very cool. You guys all get bananas, okay. Um, so uh, what, what do I mean by tight coupling? So remember that you're building your software in parts, in various pieces, right? Um, what you want to make sure to have is the pieces, the separate pieces should stay as separate from each other as possible. Each piece should have a very thin, small communication channel through which it communicates with the rest of the system. This is your API, right? your interface, your programming interface. First, keep your programming interfaces as small as possible. Why? Well, what is an interface? Well, we talked about that it's sort of the medium that you communicate through, right? But this medium basically has a promise, right? It promises you that if you call this, it will do that, right? It's a guarantee. If you call this function with these arguments, you will have this output or this behavior or whatever. Promises are hard to keep. Promises are hard to keep. The more promises you make, the harder it is to keep them. Make sense? So the more, the bigger API you have, the more promises you make. The more you say, don't worry, call this function and this function and this one, I promise you all of this will work and it will work like this. The more promises you make, the harder it is to keep them. So try to minimize the number of promises that you're making. Have your APIs be as small as possible. That's number one. The second thing is that when you implement the actual code behind your interfaces, the actual implementation of your modules, try to have as few dependencies on other things as you possibly can. Okay? In other words, coupling means like bringing, bringing things together, bringing pieces together. Try to keep them as separate as possible. Dependencies bring things together. So minimize the number of dependencies you have on other things. This will also help you and make it easier for you to test because now in order to test this thing You don't need to bring all these other things. You can just take this one thing and test it separately Take this other thing test that separately Make sense? Okay, cool um, Avoid premature optimization. So whenever I put this slide up people always say so do you mean like I can write really crappy code? No. Premature optimization doesn't mean that you should use bubble sort and then realize the complexity is like this and go, ooh, I should probably use a different sorting algorithm. That's not what I mean by optimization. By optimization, I mean like adding a caching layer to your system. Uh, everyone knows what caching is? Who doesn't know what caching is? Okay, so very quickly, just, I know you guys know, but just two seconds. Okay, what is a cache? Well, an example of a cache. In your browser, let's say you want to look, you go to Facebook and you go to my profile, right? So you request, you make a request to Facebook saying, give me Ruben's information, right? And it sends it to you and there's like a, pic a picture URL and then it says, you know, go download that picture, it downloads my picture and yeah, you show up on your thing, right? So you're going to the server to take all the stuff in, right? You're also maybe downloading CSS files, JavaScript files, you're downloading all these things, right? Imagine you close your browser and you go back to my page. Instead of going again to the server and downloading all this, the browser already has my picture downloaded. It already has all these things downloaded, right? So it just uses it. That is your cache. It's like your local store. 
It first checks there. If it doesn't exist, then it goes and gets it. Got it? Okay, so that's a cache. So that's a, so adding a caching layer or adding special casing to your code to make things go faster. In almost every instance that I've seen where optimization is added to code, typically this means adding more code. Okay? But remember, more code means more complexity, right? So what you want to do is don't add complexity to your code unless you absolutely need it. That is to say, don't optimize your code prematurely. Don't optimize your code right away. Build your, your, your system. Find the bottlenecks. What is a bottleneck? A bottleneck is the part of the system that is slowing everything else down. If you don't do this, if you optimize here and you have this be super fast, it might not actually increase the performance of your system because something else is still slowing everything down. So any performance gains you make here don't actually affect the overall system, right? So whenever you're adding code to increase performance for whatever reason, whether you're increasing, you know, you're, you're optimizing for memory or you're optimizing for, for CPU usage, it doesn't matter. Any optimization that you do, make sure you can measure it. And make sure that it, when you measure it and you add the performance, it actually becomes better. You're actually improving performance. If you add optimizations to your code and it doesn't improve anything, you've just added more dead code, right? You just added code that doesn't do anything. You made your code more complicated for no reason. And you spent all the extra time writing that code. Right? So whenever you're optimizing, so, so first of all, don't optimize at the beginning, build your system, find what is slowing things down. Because remember, our intuitions about what's slowing things down are often wrong. The part that you think is going to be the bottleneck often isn't. So understand what is the bottleneck? What is the thing that is slowing down your system? Concentrate on that, optimize that. Don't worry about the rest. Because if you optimize something here, nothing is going to change. This is still here. Make sense? Cool. Okay. Um, so I see this very often in industry. Um, so agile software development is like a common term now, where you basically, you know, you break up your development into these sprints, like these, you know, two, three, one week, doesn't, it, it varies a little bit, sprints. Where basically it's like, we're going to build, you know, these three things and then, <laughs> you know, and you build it and, and then you have a deadline and then we're going to build these other things and, <laughs> and you run to the next, right? And you sort of, and this is basically meant to keep you moving and keep you building your software. The problem that I found though is very often engineers will take shortcuts and do hacks basically in their code to meet the deadline. They won't take the time to refactor, as I mentioned, right? They won't take the time to clean their code. They won't take the time to optimize their code. And by optimize, I don't mean the optimization. I mean to make it smaller, to simplify their code. They just do something. It works. It passes the tests. Okay, done. Next. Boom. They go to Jira. They get the next ticket. Pom, pom, pom. Until they, so they, at the deadline, they're done. Their manager says, good boy. The problem with this is any shortcuts that you make, any hacks that you put in into your code, Think of it as debt. It's, it's known as technical debt. And debt has to be paid at some point or another. So even if at the beginning you're meeting deadlines and everything is great because you just keep hacking the crap out of your code, fine, but it will catch up to you. Eventually, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have dirty, smelly, nasty code that you then, for the next sprint, have to add features to, for example which is going to make it that much more difficult, not to mention all the bugs you're going to introduce in the process. Really, yes, sir? But sometimes if you don't meet the deadlines, you will not continue working on the project, right? <laughs> it's, it's rare, okay, yes, okay. So here, I, I should have mentioned, you're right, you're right. I should have mentioned this point. Don't make compromises unless you absolutely have to. The problem that the mistake that a lot of engineers th make though is they think that's all the time. Most of the time, this is not the case actually. Most of the, it's very rare where it's like, if it's one day late, you're fired. Like, <laughs> and if you explain to your product manager or whatever that, look, my code has this problem. I don't want to hack it. I want to do the right thing. If they fire you because you didn't hack it and meet the deadline, you're probably working at the wrong company, right? Just think about it. Um, if you're working at a company that understands software, they will understand that it's better to have correct software than fast software. Interesting point. You can go really fast 
and put in hacks and meet deadlines, but that will actually increase the amount of time you're building software. Let me explain why. Most engineers think that a lot of, most of the time is spent building things. That's actually not true. Building things is no problem. It's like 20%. Like you build it and it's there and awesome. It's the other 80% that is the problem when you're actually spending debugging things, finding all the problems, figuring out why does this, oh my God, everything works except this one thing, or your system is working beautifully and then everything slows down. Try finding that. That is going to, you are going to spend way more time trying to fix things than trying to build things. So minimizing that impact, minimizing that, is a good thing. So anything you can do upfront, writing unit tests, spending more time cleaning your code, keeping it simple, whatever, will actually save time at the duration to the at the duration of the project. Doing things fast at the beginning, not writing tests, making the code smelly and dirty at the beginning will actually extend possibly even make your project fail at the end. Do you guys understand why? It makes sense? Okay. Questions, concerns so far? No? Okay. Are we? Shoot, how fast does time fly? Okay. Uh, hang on. Oh man, we had so much to talk about. Uh, uh, huh? Do you guys have anywhere to go? If you, uh. Okay, well, let me just mention a few things very quickly. Okay, naming conventions really matter. Be careful about how you name things. Uh, try to stick to conventions. What I mean by this is if you, for example, in my code, the variable i always stands for iterator. So if you have a for loop, the iteration variable is always i. But it's not, I don't use i anywhere else. So the advantage of this is anytime someone reading my code sees i, they know what it is. They don't have to read the code to understand what it is. A lot of times we'll, people will use the dollar sign to mean jQuery, for example, for JavaScript hackers, right? Don't use dollar to mean something else. But at the same time, always use dollar to mean jQuery because that is the convention. This is what the agreed upon pattern is. Uh, so when you name things, try to stick to the convention, but don't break the convention. If I were to use I to mean something else, somewhere else, people will get confused and possibly introduce problems, right? So stick to, uh, stick, so name your variables the same way everywhere. Wow, we really didn't have a lot of time. Okay, composition versus inheritance. And who knows what composition is? Okay, like three people, okay. All right, so with inheritance, you know. Uh, so basically, when you're building systems, you build systems in parts and you combine them together, right? There are a few ways to do this. One way is through inheritance, where you have a piece of code here, you have a piece of code, and you sort of push this code on top of this code, and now this code has everything that this code has plus anything that it had over the top. And then that can then be pushed onto another one and another one, and this is how we have inheritance, right? This is how we stick code together in inheritance. With composition, it's different. With composition, you have a piece of code here and a piece of code here, and instead of merging them together, you simply have this reference that. And when you want some behavior, you just call it. What is the advantage of this over inheritance? The advantage is that the implementation of this object can change. If you decide, you know what, instead of referencing this, it should reference that, the only thing you change is the implementation, the code inside of this one thing. With inheritance, if you change the code of any object, all the child objects get affected, right? So it's a much bigger change. You're not just modifying the one thing, you're modifying an entire structure. Why is this bad? Whenever you're building a project, the, the time when you know least amount about the project is at the beginning, and the time when you know most about the project is at the end. Makes sense, right? You guys agree. Okay. But the problem is if you look at how typically object-oriented programming is done, you build your class hierarchy at the beginning. You say this is going to inherit from this and so on. In Java, the first thing you do is you make a class, right? So you make all your classes, you do all your inheritance, and you start coding, and then you go, oops. And that oops means you have to refactor your tree, your hierarchy. And the moment you have to refactor your tree, you affect the entire system. In composition, on the other hand, you, you set up your objects, they can use each other if they want. Later, if you need to change something, you just change that one object. You don't affect the entire system. 
Okay, this is the argument for composition, right? Now, uh, yes. In, in terms of what? More memory than it's it's it depends on how it's implemented. So, for example, prototypal inheritance in JavaScript, even though it's inheritance, it's actually almost like composition because you have a separate object here, a separate object here with a prototypal reference from here to there. Oh, no, no problem. Okay, that's a that's a that's more of how the platform implements like memory usage and so on, which can be optimized. That's what you said is true, might be true, but it's a it's a minor thing. It's it's so small that don't don't even worry about that. More, more worry more about this is so this is the key. Worry more about writing code that is correct and simple than about little things like this. Even if if writing inheritance takes up a bit more memory, if it helps you write better, cleaner code, it's okay. Do it. It's better to write good, clean code than to worry about these little tiny optimizations. Because in the end, they don't, they don't actually matter. What matters is your code works. And if your code doesn't work, none of that stuff matters. Yes? Cool. Um, I know we're... Uh, learn functional programming. I, I'm actually giving a talk at the JS conference in December about functional programming. So if you guys want to come to that, we'll talk about that then. Uh, security matters. Building great software that looks amazing, that has the nice buttons, is great, but if it doesn't have good security underneath, it's useless because you're going to give it to your customer. The customer is going to say, wow, what a beautiful software. It does what I want. This is amazing. They deploy it, and then suddenly they get hacked, and all of the identities that get stolen, credit card numbers are stolen, and it's a disaster. The problem with this is a lot of managers overlook this because it's not visible. Right? They often don't add it to a sprint or they don't add it to their spec because you don't see it. You don't see security. When you look at a software, you don't go, wow, that software looks secure. Right? No one is impressed by security. It doesn't make the customers wow. Right? But the problem is if you don't have it, it's a big problem. So it's one of those disciplines that you as professionals, as programming professionals, have to have when you're writing your code. An example of this is SQL injection. Just very quickly, I know we're short on time, but this really matters. A lot of people go through this process, right? My, people that, that my, my students know this. So we learn strings, right? So with strings, you say, okay, I can make a string, okay? I can concatenate strings together and make bigger strings, fine. I can concatenate a string with another data type, like an integer or something, stick it together and suddenly get, I get a string with a number inside. Then you start doing writing code on the server and you say I want to communicate with the, with a database and the database generally takes queries as strings queries being like the, the, the language that they take to do things as strings and then you get inputs from the, the client from the browser coming into the server and you say okay well that's a, let's say an integer like an age I can concatenate that to my query and then create a string and then give it to my database and everything is good, right? The problem is this is wrong. This will get you hacked. Because you, what if val was actually another part of the query that you just concatenate into your query, changing your query and making it do something different, right? This is how SQL attacks happen. This is sort of the right way to do it, right? Is, well, depending on what library or framework you're using, it, you, do, you pass the variable separately and it does the proper escaping and injects the values in. Don't worry about the specifics of this code, but here's the point I'm making. This is easy and intuitive. This is what, if you just learned how to program, this is what you would do. This you have to know to do. You have to know to do this and know not to do that. So this is a problem with security. It's an opt-in model. If you don't know how to write your code securely, the default is you're going to write insecure code which is dangerous. And this is why all over the world people are getting hacked with SQL injection attacks. Because most engineers don't have this knowledge and do things incorrectly. So as software professionals, you have to take the time to read about software engineering security. Because if you don't know to do this, you will do this. And this is a big problem. Okay? Okay. Uh, Okay, lastly, and I'll let you guys go. This is the last slide. I know, so cute. Um, 
with all the patterns that I've mentioned, with all the things that I've shared with you from my experiences with you know, minimizing complexity in your code and security and so on, there is one constant. There are no formulas. There are no rules. There's no like do this, this, and this, and you will have great software. Um, refactoring doesn't have rules. There's no standard way like this is how you refactor code. You read the book, now you know how to refactor code. It doesn't work that way. All of this knowledge comes with experience. It comes with intuition. The more code you write, the better you understand how code fits together and what works and what does not. This isn't something that you can learn just by reading a book. It's something you have to do, and you have to do a lot. This is why a senior engineer, a senior programmer, isn't just someone who's good at coding. It's someone who has the experience in coding, right? This is why time matters. The more time you spend coding, the better programmer you become. And no, bo no book or no AUA, nothing else is going to help you become a better engineer unless you actually sit down and program. AUA will give you tools, it will give you knowledge, but until you actually sit down and start writing code and making mistakes and saying oops a whole bunch of times, you will not become better. Right? So write code as much as you can. That's it. Thank you very much.